Well, good evening everyone and welcome to this webinar on mapping Enlightenment Edinburgh. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Matt Curator at the National Library of Scotland, where I have worked since 1994. And uh, my main job at the National Library has been on the National Library's Maps website, where we now make freely available over a quarter of a million high resolution images of historic maps. I've also researched and published on some of these maps and co-authored the book Edinburgh Mapping the City, published in 2014. Now this book covered five centuries of maps of Edinburgh and uh, talking about five centuries of maps was always a challenge. So today I've chosen to focus on a century or so of interesting maps from the early 18th century through to the early 19th century. Uh, the choice of the Enlightenment was inspired by the library's Northern Lights exhibition, which uh, has, has recently finished. Uh, but there are pages about it online on the library's website, as well as a, a learning zone resource. Now maps, of course, provide many insights into the development of Enlightenment Edinburgh. At an immediate level, they provide a detailed graphic portrayal of the development of Enlightenment Edinburgh. But of course, maps do much more than this. They often illustrate the differences between intentions and reality, between proposals and their implementation. They give us the imagined or unbuilt Edinburgh that could have been. Maps celebrate the vision and ambition of particular people and institutions, especially surveyors, architects, draftsmen and engravers. This is James Craig's unrealized proposals for the development of South Bridge, orientated with west to the top, and with an octagonal square, you can see that here in the center, running around the Tron and a circular crescent to the south, which met with South Bridge. There's also an attractive profile at the top of the, the map as well. But the plan would have involved substantial demolition of buildings, which is one reason why it was never implemented. At deeper levels, maps reflected the way people thought about the city and what was important to them at the time. Perhaps most important of all, these maps always select certain features of the landscape over others sometimes being deliberately deceptive. This building plan here for Dean Estate in 1850 cleverly shortens the Dean Bridge, which you can see down here, to a third of its real length. So making the whole development on this side look much closer to the more prestigious housing in the Moria Estate of the new town. Now, before we look at the maps themselves, it's useful to look at three underlying factors that influenced them all. And the first of these was really the growing acceptance of enlightenment values and thinking. Scottish map publishing was transformed during the 18th and early 19th century. There was a huge growth in volume in numbers of map makers, maps themselves and map users, particularly after 1745. Driven by changes in society, maps were produced for different and new purposes. The predominance of military mapping up to the middle of the 18th century was replaced by a range of new maps, such as those for charting the rapid changes in the countryside, or subjects like enclosure, in this case allocating land between landowners, such as this plan of the 1779 uh, land ownership around the Nor Loch. Or in turn, for planning things like new roads and routeways, such as this plan which sketched in proposed railways and roads connecting the proposed harbour at Granton with Edinburgh in the 1830s. Of greater importance still, the form and content of these maps reflected a new set of cultural values. Not only did the world assume a new geographical shape through maps, but the way this world was presented on the printed page change. John Cowley highlighted what was perceived as being a growing problem of how uncertain the geography of Scotland was in this map of 1734, which 
with its six different outlines of the country. You can see these to the side here by leading geographers. Increasingly, accuracy of measurements in the Enlightenment became an essential indicator of cartographic progress, along with an increasing emphasis on original survey, on more precise instruments, and on more detailed mapping as ends in themselves. Arguably, under this geometrical spirit, maps became plainer, they were stripped of their artistic ornamentation and were able to assemble a steadily growing number of facts within a neat geometrical grid of lines of latitude and longitude. The blank parts of, uh, of this, uh, the map here of, of Africa and America, for example, no longer needed to be filled with dragons or legendary places as maps so often did before. James Craig's plan of the new town, although very simple and obvious in form, if nothing else, epitomized these deeper values. These change values are also partly illustrated through the contrast in perspective from James Gordon's bird's eye view of Edinburgh from 1647, which you can see on the left here, deliberately widening the Royal Mile and allowing the street frontages to be seen from William Edgar's overhead perspective in 1742, the first directly overhead plan of the city. A second important factor behind all of these maps was the growth of engraving and printing in Edinburgh. Richard Cooper, for example, settled in Edinburgh as a youth and is credited with the real beginning of a school of engraving in the city. One of his pupils was Andrew Bell, co-founder of the Encyclopedia Britannica, who also engraved maps, including the 1773 map we'll look at in a moment on the early development of the new town. Daniel Lizars was apprenticed to Bell and in turn trained his own sons, Daniel and William Home, as well as George Bartholomew, the eldest of the Bartholomew family of engravers. Amongst other things, George Bartholomew will go on to engrave this town plan of leaf, the John Woods Town Atlas. Until the early 18th century, maps were sent outside of Edinburgh and often to the continent to be engraved and published. But thereafter, these activities were increasingly centered in Edinburgh itself. John Thompson, who was in St. Andrew's Square during the 1820s, brought out a monumental folio atlas of Scotland, engraved and published in Edinburgh, fully superseding the Blau Atlas of the 17th century, which had been published in Amsterdam. During the 19th century, the Edinburgh map publishers, William and Alexander Keith Johnston and John George Bartholomew became justly famous all over the world. A third crucial development behind all of these maps was the rise of the map buying market. Edinburgh's population more than doubled in the course of the 18th century, partly illustrated by the expanding new town that we can see there to the right on Barker's panorama, and the population nearly doubled again to 165,000 in 1841. The city provided a market for a developing print culture in periodicals from the 1760s. Newspapers carried maps to illustrate the events of the day. Public lecture classes and private academies brought the world's fairs, affairs to the attention of discerning publics. Students, the book buying public and members of learned societies all had need of maps. Many were financed by civic and other patrons, illustrated by the dedication uh, on this map to David Stewart, Lord Provost, as well as by subscribers and buyers within these emerging urban markets. Now I'd now like to devote the, the remainder of this brief talk to looking at a selection of some of the most important maps depicting the growth of Enlightenment Edinburgh in the period from 1750 to 1850. Many other selections could be made and my selection is very much based on, on um, the published printed maps of the city, especially uh, those looking at uh, social and political change. And we'll ask as we go through them how far they misrepresent as well as represent what was going on. William Edgar's map of 1742 is an excellent place to start our journey as it shows everything on the brink of change and expansion. 
Edgar worked as a military surveyor. He died near Port Augustus in 1745. And his plan survives today, very much through its in inclusion in William Maitland's history book of Edinburgh. We are lucky in having a revised edition of Edgar's map from two decades later. Excuse me a moment, and I'll find that for you. There we are. Um, which shows the Royal Exchange, this appears here, and also the plans for North Bridge. It was also always easier to correct an existing map engraved on copper than to create a completely new one. And this updated Edgar map, the one on the right, shows a number of new buildings with slightly bolder lines. Excuse me a moment, I've uh, slightly lost my auto cue. Here we are again. Uh, the famous 1752 proposals for public works in the city of Edinburgh recommended the construction of a building for merchants on the north side of the high street. And we can see that here in the Royal Exchange completed in 1761. A little further down the high street, marked by peck lines and this uh, letter R, are, are the intended course of the first North Bridge. We move on to look at James Craig's proposals for the new town. Craig was arguably not an architectural genius, and his final plan was described by Youngson as poor in its simplicity, redeemed only by its superb site. Even before publication in 1768, there were important modifications. Some of these revisions can be seen here. The result of consultation with King George III, who suggested that St. Giles Street, the original name for Princess Street, should be renamed because it reminded him of a part of London always infamous for its low and disorderly inhabitants. Queen Charlotte, meanwhile, felt that Queen Street would sound better than Charlotte Street, and her wishes were adhered to, but in the event, the Queen would also have St. George's Square, shown over here on the left-hand side, renamed Charlotte Square after her as well from 1785. This of course completely ruined the, the unionist symmetry of the saints' names in the plan shown here, but it had the merit of avoiding confusion with the other George Square. There are other earlier manuscript versions of Craig's plan. This one from the Museum of Edinburgh showing a circus at the junction of George Street and Frederick Street. An interesting might have been other changes resulted from local politics. Sir Lawrence Dundas, the wealthy politician and landowner who had secured the parliamentary act that led to the building of the new town, had also purchased in advance the land immediately east of St Andrew's Square. And although Craig had intended that a church would be built here on this site, Dundas had his own palatial villa, now the Royal Bank of Scotland, constructed there, and the church had to be built on George Street instead. In many ways, these alterations were mere tinkering with an essential form that remained unaltered throughout. A rational, ordered, symmetrical grid of streets that not only chimed in with Enlightenment ideas in a graphical form, but also with the prevailing French doctrine that new town should also glorify the reigning monarch. Craig's dedication left no room for doubt about this last point, describing George III as the munificent patron of every polite and liberal art. Edinburgh has his ancient capital of North Britain and the new town as the happy consequences of the peace, security and liberty his people enjoy under his mild and auspicious government. The last Jacobite rebellion, which had nearly overthrown the monarch, had happened just 20 years earlier. But of course, everyone had completely forgotten about this by now. In order to construct the new town, Edinburgh Town Council had to engage in a series of acquisitions to the land uh, to the north of, of the Norloch. And Bell's map here of 1773 shows some of these along with transitional patterns of roads and buildings. The rising ground between the Norloch and the original Lang Dykes Road that we can see here running across between uh, Princess Street and Rose Street had been acquired by the Hepburns of Bareford in 1645, who sold it to the town council 
in 1717, and it was often known as we see here as Barefoot Parks. However, the largest landowner in the Newtown area and immediately to the north was Heriot's Hospital, as we see here to the top. Bell's plan also captures the early building developments of the eastern end of the new town, as well as the Lawrence Dundas Villa. You can also see the outlines of the new register house. Construction began in the following year, and the Theatre Royal or Playhouse, founded in 1768. The focus of development in the 1780s moved to the south of the Royal Mile with the construction of South Bridge, over a thousand feet long and carried on 22 arches. The completion of North Bridge in 1772 provided the obvious line to take to the south and following the necessary act of parliament, the foundations of South Bridge were laid by August 1785. Work was completed amazingly only three years later. And this plan was very much a pocket foldable work, particularly for visitors. Thomas Brown and James Watson were both independent booksellers and stationers and members of the Edinburgh Booksellers Society. They were based initially in Parliament Close in the 1780s and moved to the newly constructed bridges in the 1790s. Further south, we can also see Robert Adams' original planned layout for Edinburgh University's old college, at this time only partly built on its eastern side. Adam had put forward alternative and more grandiose proposals for both Southbridge and the college, which were not adopted. But he successfully sued the city for costs and the, in the end was awarded the college architectural work, even though it had a new brief. Adam died in 1793, the year this map was published, and further work was delayed until 1815 due to the financial stresses of the Napoleonic Wars to quite a different design and layout. One of the most striking, clear, attractive, but fundamentally misleading maps of Edinburgh was surveyed and published by John Ainsley in 1804. This was an impressive poster-sized map, which looks dis best displayed on a large wall, and is one of the earliest to include both Edinburgh and Leith on one sheet. Zooming in on this detail, on the northern Newtown, including Cannon Mills and Broughton, shows areas that were actively developed during the first quarter of the 19th century. But disentangling real from planned streets and buildings is far from easy. Whilst the new town to the south of Queen Street was largely complete by this time, many of the streets and buildings to the north of it were only planned from 1802 and would not be constructed for another two or three decades. Not always according to the scheme shown here. For example, the Royal Circus would continue to have a crucial diagonal cut across it, the easiest way to Stockbridge, while the streets around Drummond Place, Nelson Street, for example, took a variant form. Although ambitious plans were drawn up by William Playfair to develop the Colton Newtown east of Leith Walk in the following decade, these were largely not carried out in practice, splendid though they looked on paper. Building started promptly, but a number of difficulties stored development until the 1860s, by which time it was executed to quite a different pattern. Kirkwood's plan and elevation of the new town is a uniquely impressive and beautifully engraved graphic. And as its title suggests, it manages to flatten all the elevations of the buildings in the new town into a conventional overhead plan thereby compressing three dimensions into two. Those who study early 19th century Edinburgh are indebted to the Kirkwoods for their high quality surveying and engraving work. We know from town council records that Kirkwood appealed for financial aid in publishing this plan, but it was refused. And the plan gives us a rare insight into reality on the ground rather than a proposal. Now with Northbridge and Southbridge settled in, allowing residents and visitors to, to, to excuse me, traverse Edinburgh's a talent, challenging topography, the need for a straight, wide and splendid bridge from the east became a priority. Robert Stevenson, whose work encompassed lighthouses, canals, harbors and railways was directly responsible for the design and construction of Edinburgh's Regent Road 
and the dramatic Regent Bridge in Waterloo Place. This large hand-drawn plan, probably produced for the town council, also traces ideas further west to bypass the narrow Westport into the grass market, as well as the Westbow's awkward zigzag you can see here going up from the grass market to lawn market. In the event, Thomas Hamilton's alternative scheme was approved by an Act of Parliament in 1827, but more than a decade had passed before it was implemented. We met the publisher, John Thompson, earlier. A map of Edinburgh in his folio, Atlas of Scotland, is another one blending the present with the future in trying to anticipate proposed developments, only some of which were executed. These include the Colton Newtown that we saw earlier on the east side of Leith Walk, as well as this unbuilt estate uh, in, in Pilrig on the other side. The Dean Hay estate to the west of Stockbridge and the Coates estate in the West End also show more buildings in different patterns than was really the case on the ground. A similar juxtaposition of reality with future plans can be found in this map by John Wood, one of the most important private surveyors of maps during this period. Looking at this plan from the top down, we see proposed developments including streets and buildings on the, the Dean Estate over here, a rectangular layout for Saxe Coburg Place, the National Monument, as we see uh, indicated here as a national church, the projected streets in the Orchard Field Estate east of the Lothian Road over here and Castle Terrace. What would become Johnston Terrace is sketched in, although not in the correct alignment with King's Bridge, while Victoria Street and George IV Bridge are shown at least a decade before their construction. Just north of Old College along here is a proposed street which anticipates the Chamber Street development by half a century. Particularly due to the financial crash of 1825 to 6 and arrested development thereafter, building took quite a different pattern to that depicted, often decades later. As we know, the National Monument was abandoned after just three years due to lack of funds. As my time is now running, running out, I'll uh, skip through uh, the next map and finish with this map by by William Home Lazars of 1852 from the Scottish Tourist. The Scottish Tourist was a, a detailed and lengthy guide to Scotland that had first been published from 1825 to the general approval of Sir Walter Scott. And by 1852, the book was in its 19th edition, comprising 664 pages with 71 views and 17 maps, all engraved on steel by William Home Lazars. And Lazar's charmingly engraved vignettes of various Edinburgh landmarks around the side of the map convey the, the general equivalency that developed during this time between all tourist attractions, almost regardless of age or character. Harriet's Hospital over here from the reign of Charles I stands cheek by jowl with Donaldson's Hospital over here, completed just one year before the map itself. To the lower left, a lady with a parasol has the option of surveying either the genuine medieval battlements of Edinburgh Castle to her right, or the mock medieval ones of the Georgian prison to her left. The grand tour of the preceding century had taken seeing the works of the ancient Greeks and Romans as its theme and guiding principle. And the vignettes show how the sites of whatever period were all now equally available for touristic consumption. The map itself continues this trend. The differing tints of its early color coding scheme are all that separate places of instruction from places of entertainment, churches and chapels from banks and markets, hotels from prisons. This map in many ways is a foretaste of things to come. So what can we say by way of conclusion? Maps, I feel, present the history of Edinburgh in one of its most enthralling forms, but they do not do so simply. They are never straightforward facsimiles of the real world out there. Importantly, 
These maps also played an essential role in the creation of the idea of Enlightenment Edinburgh. The role that they played in influencing hearts and minds to think and act towards Edinburgh in a particular way. The ever-changing built townscape that we enjoy today reflects the vision of people and their ideas, along with a healthy dose of economics, politics, and topography. But not least, it reflects lines drawn on, drawn on maps from centuries ago. Thank you very much.